Thank you for attending, everyone, and hello to people who is coming in online. Um, really appreciate you coming today. So, um, as you all know, we're running this uh, Europe's Clean Transport Future event on behalf of the European Public Health Alliance um, out of Brussels today. <coughs> uh, my name's Kale. I am Senior Policy Manager in the Global Public Health Cluster at EFA, so working on climate change, planetary health, air pollution, antimicrobial resistance, and global health strategy. So today we're specifically going to be talking about clean transport policy in Europe because we have a bit of a policy opportunity here in that we've got multiple air quality related policies working their way through the European um, structures and uh, including specifically transport policies. So um, yeah, we're going to talk about a few of those, a few of the ones that we work with, and we've got some great speakers here today who are also going to give multiple uh, inputs on their specific work fields and we're going to be framing this from kind of where do we need to go to protect health in Europe you know and what do we need what kind of policies do we need to to get to where we want to be in pub in terms of public health and what we need to do to get there and what we should be advocating around really so in terms of the transport systems we have in Europe at the moment we have a transport system that well naturally and probably will always contribute to air pollution and to carbon emissions but the way we have it at the moment, considering you know the technology and the public health needs that we have in Europe, we, we have an opportunity to do kind of a lot more to protect public health and to to reduce the risks of of um, you know um, transport related emissions and the effect. So, um, in addition to the emissions that we get from tran the transport system, we also have kind of uh, other health risks of noise pollution, the um, climate change and the degradation of planetary health. We'll go into a bit more of these things and what they mean, but just to kind of introduce them. And uh, what, we, what we are trying to, what we were aiming at is the, the end health and social well-being impact from the transport system. So the policies we're going to be looking at today are overarched by the Ambient Air Quality Directive. That is a uh, big policy, big big legislation that's working its way through. And yesterday we had a, a result from the ENVI committee, which, you know, is okay. Um, we're also going to talk about the Euro 7 emission standard and the heavy duty vehicle CO2 emission standard, which, you know, might, maybe we have a little less optimism about. <laughs> but we'll hear from some of our speakers about where that's going. Um, so just first I'll just give a bit of a brief introduction from the public health point of view of what we, why we care about this and, and where we are currently. So air pollution is a major factor in Europe. It has a massive public health effect. It's the number one environmental exposure that um, Europeans face. It causes a very large public health impact. Um, it detriments health, it detriments the economy, detriments a whole lot of other things which I'll go into in a little bit, but there is variation across Europe. Some places are cleaner, some cities are dirtier, depends on energy production, depends on transport systems, industry, geography. But just to kind of give a bit of a context, the World Health Organization released air quality guidelines in 2021 uh, based on the research as of then, just to state there is further research now that kind of shows a bit more, a bit risk below the threshold that they have set out, but in Europe, we have 97% uh, of people living over the WHO limits for particulate matter, 2.5, 76 for PM10, 90% for nitrogen dioxide, and 94% for ozone. So a lot of uh, the bulk of European population is exposed to levels which the WHO says is unsafe. Um, and as we know, carbon emissions that relate to public transport, uh, sorry, to transport have an effect on the climate. We'll get into that as well. Um, this is a very busy slide, I'm not going to go through reading all of it out, but it's there kind of just for reference. Um, the air pollution causes human mortality and morbidity. It causes an economic cost, it causes environmental damage, damage to crops, damage to buildings, damage to infrastructure, and you get the deposition of heavy metals and other you know, particles into the food chain and biomagnification with that. On the uh, right side here, we can see a list of thing, a list of different conditions which air pollution has been linked to. This list is always expanding as we're finding out more and more about air pollution and the myriad of effects it has. Uh, it causes an effect basically on every system of the body and is mediated through inflammation. Air is breathed into the lungs, it deposits, body attacks it, widespread inflammation, and that just causes... Uh, horrible things really um you know we'll we'll see but it does there is a direct link for example between the air quality on a given day and hospital emission admissions during pollution episodes so the mortality figures we have for 2020 in europe put the mortality 
from PM2.5 at 238,000. We have nitrogen dioxide at 49,000 and ozone at 24,000. These are commission estimates, just so you know, and we would always kind of think the commission estimates are fairly conservative. Some of the evidence I've seen from other research bodies put these numbers much higher. For example, I've seen one that looks at nitrogen dioxide just itself, and the number is about 10 times higher than that. So, you know, it's a bit of a... It's a bit of a, uh, it's difficult with the epidemiology kind of to identify an exact number, but we can say that it's at least these because these are the commission, the conservative commission numbers. Could you have an answer for me possibly? Oh, cool, okay, thank you. Um, Different people are more vulnerable to air pollution, the damage of air pollution, um, the extremities of age, elderly people and younger people are vulnerable. We'll go into just a case study of children in a second. Um, pregnant women are more vulnerable um, and people with pre-existing medical conditions. But also we see, and something we're very concerned about at IFA is the, um, the health inequity that we see in air pollution because you've got air pollution affecting people of lower socioeconomic status much more than people of higher socioeconomic status. There's tons of evidence really to prove this and it's really quite a shocking and sad state that we see and we see variations across Europe in terms of that as well with that effect. But we also got um, differences in terms of area of residence, geography, work, um, different environmental exposures and also healthcare access and literacy. Ah, great. So just, this is a nice little, um, nice little image here I stole from the EEA. Uh, which they've released some evidence recently which talks about the, the public health effect of air pollution on children. And because, the, you know, some people argue that uh, air pollution is something that just affect, affects older people with chronic medical conditions who, you know, might not be long for this world anyway or something like that. But that's just not, it's not true, really. And here we have the EEA, you know, the, Europe's biggest environmental body, saying that it's a serious risk for children. They've said something like 1,300 children have died every year because of air pollution in Europe, which is an unacceptable number, really. Um, when we just go into the health costs, again, I won't go through all of this. It's just a lot of kind of things to explain where we're coming from and to prove that it is a significant impact. Um, the health cost in Europe, as modelled by the Commission, 231 to 800 billion euro per year. So nothing to sneeze at. Um, but also we've got multiple different measures here which look at different things. And if we take kind of the middle one there, the cost of health impacts and mortality in the WHO Europe region 2015, 1.6 trillion US dollars per year, which, you know, imagine what you could do with that money. Um, and EFA, an EFA commission study showed that in 432 European cities, the cost was 166 billion a year. So we're looking at different frames here, but it proves the point that this is, has, exerts a massive impact on Europe. Um, to reiterate it in no uncertain terms, there is no safe level of air pollution and um, everyone is vulnerable essentially. We have people who are more vulnerable but everyone is vulnerable and some of our colleagues that we work with continue to demonstrate this that at lower and lower and lower amounts of pollution than we thought before there is health effects. So we really need to, you know, this is the impetus for what we're going to, why we want to do this, why we want a clean, clean transport system and what we can do to support public health in Europe. Okay, so I've got a little, a tiny little case study here, um, just an example of nitrogen dioxide in Europe. So we've got 90% of the European urban population um, at living in areas with nitrogen dioxide levels above the WHO guidelines, and road transport is one of the largest contributors to nitrogen dioxide pollution in Europe. Um, as we can see here in the graphs, um, these are different, different air pollutants here, and the ones in orange with the numbers are the contribution from transport to each of those, to each of those um, different pollutants. And, you know, we talk about nitrogen dioxide here, but there are other pollutants as well, but this is just the case for nitrogen dioxide. Um, these are a nice little set of images that we've commissioned at IFA to talk about um, different effects. This is, our work here is in reference to the heavy duty vehicle CO2 emission standard, but, you know, when we look at climate change, we're going to see a myriad, myriad of, uh, of public health impacts. This is some of them. But, you know, we had a capacity building event last week here at IFA and we went through for quite a long time and quite a, to a depressing degree about the amount of health impacts that we could see. But just in general, these are some of the ones we could see. So increased pandemic and infectious risk, increased health, heat stress, decreased water security, distorted food systems, forced migration and negative impacts on mental health. 
I'm not saying that you know transport leads to this necessarily, but it is part of the system that does contribute to a change in climate that will have vast um, public health impacts. We've also got another one here just to talk a bit about planetary health as well. So planetary health is this kind of consideration of human, animal, environmental health within one sphere, knowing that they are all interconnected. Um, so there's just a, a tiny bit here. I won't go through the details of it, but the, the emissions you get from transport also degrade planetary health. They affect animals, they affect the environment. Um, so there's multiple reasons that we'd like to look at a cleaner transport system, really. We have so much to gain and so much public health to gain. So going forward today, as we hear from um, some of the different speakers, what, I'd what I would like to advocate for is that, that we have the opportunity for cleaner health systems. Um, sustainable transport is economically feasible and technically um, achievable. We're gonna hear some talks on that. Um, the health impacts are largely preventable and unacceptable. Um, there are multiple co-benefits to a clean transport system, which uh, including, effect inf including affecting health, climate, environment, and high ambition will equal high returns and high social and health returns. We're gonna go straight to Kastudis Kupsis here. Come on up and please welcome Kastudis. So what's my time limit, 10 minutes? And let me know if I'm speaking uh, to um, <clears throat> uh, if, if, if I can be heard uh, adequately, okay? So it's not too loud, I, I hope. And <clears throat> I have an opinion of the Economic and Social Committee, the, the European Economic and Social Committee here, and I'm the rapporteur of that opinion. So from our discussions around the lunch table, I understood that probably this committee needs some introduction. And indeed, we are part of the European institutional architecture. The committee exists for, uh, it's, it exists since 60s, and uh, it is an advisory body for, in the legislative uh, process. So when we get a, a referral from the commission, we issue an opinion. And of course, after the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the um, AAQDs, yeah? Ambient Air Quality Directives Review, came to us. We took this as an opportunity to issue the civil society's view on that uh, initiative. So the committee consists of three parts. It is approximately 300 people coming from uh, 27 European Union countries. And approximately 100 is employers, 100 is employees represented by trade unions, and another 100 is civil society organizations from very diverse backgrounds. I personally I come from Lithuania, that's my uh, country, that's, that's a country that delegated me to the committee and I represent consumers, I represent consumers' uh, movement. The topic of transport and relation of transport with the ambient air quality is something which came first to my mind when I was barely 18. And that was a time when we tried in my uh, native city, Klaipeda, on the shores of the Baltic Sea, when we tried to measure, I was part of the chemistry class then, we tried to measure the exhaust gas, uh, uh, let's say, concentrations from the diesel buses. So you can imagine how bad it was. And now, of course, we can probably see with our own eyes the progress we made. <clears throat> we now don't count it in millions. Yeah? The, the number of deaths is no longer in millions, but it's in hundreds of thousands. Should we stop at this? Well, as the rapporteur for an institution which is European official institution, I need to stick to the script a bit. So in some instances, I will simply uh, cite you some phrases which we uh, decided have to be a core of our opinion. The, the whole opinion is something like eight pages. It's easy to read and it's available on our web page. 
So first of all, of course, we recognize that reducing air pollution has large core benefits, as you already explained uh, earlier today. The core benefits for climate mitigation, for energy security, and for biodiversity. Uh, again, a little bit of a side note, if you allow. I was in the Salzia Baden. Is that the correct pronunciation? Uh, seminar in March. And the, probably the most uh, impressive presentation I've heard was from an from a academia world. They told we are experiencing uh, the alkaline air. It's no longer, no, 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 no longer acid air. The atmospheric composition is changing if you take a longer perspective. So since those times when we had uh, uh, acid rains in Europe, the atmospheric pH level is no longer so acidic anymore. But it's because we are quite successful in addressing the sulfur dioxide issue, which was creating the, the, the acid rain to some extent. And now the, the much more uh, important problem is perhaps the alkaline part of the spectrum. Yeah? So if you, if you are no longer acidic, then you become alkaline. And this is because of the uh, agriculture. So relating that, relating the huge amount of uh, ammonia emissions, uh, methane from agriculture, and thinking about the crops, what we are seeing is that this alkaline air phenomenon becomes a, a real issue for the biodiversity. And that was very clearly shown on how it affects plants. <clears throat> so in the opinion, we know the, we, we all here know the, the issues, we know the challenges. That's why in the opinion we call for the European Union to seek an alignment with the WHO guidelines, not from 2005, but from the latest ones, from September 2021. Because as it seems now, with the proposal which is now on the table, <clears throat> it seems that we are much more keen to align with the 2005 WHO guidelines, and not the, the latest one, with the exception of nitrogen dioxide, I have to say. So this call is also in our opinion, and that reflects the call from the civil society. <clears throat> we want funding for citizen science projects. I was part of that, of, of one of such projects. We organized uh, regionally free consumer organizations, joining forces, putting nitrogen uh, dioxide measuring tubes, very small ones, very cheap ones, in various places in the biggest cities of Lithuania, Poland, and Slovakia. Of course, the results cannot uh, be satisfactory. In some of the busiest streets of Vilnius, and actually <clears throat> almost next to the former office of our environment commissioner, Mr. Sinkavichus, he's now in Brussels, not in Vilnius anymore, but next to his office when he was a minister, we find, for example, 35 micrograms per cubic meter NO2 concentration. And that is very close to the 40, which is the, let's say, limit value. So we use the results from multiple cities in the region to raise awareness and to show city uh, fathers, city mayors, that <clears throat> they need to be aware of pollution from transport when it comes uh, to placing or to finding spots for kindergartens, for children playgrounds, for schools. And it's, it's unacceptable when you have a, a busy street, 35 micrograms of NO2, and the school just next door. So there is only something like 30, 30 meters gap <clears throat> between the polluting transport and the... So I 
I cannot go in 10 minutes through all the opinions, uh, weak and strong points, so probably you may find time to <clears throat> read it and to gain some inspiration. We just call for a, for a real ambition, and we believe that transport is a decisive uh, instrument to achieve cleaner air in Europe. So we list, for example, certain measures. We start with uh, emission uh, limits for stoves and boilers, okay? If it's still about fossil fuel stoves and boilers, let's put a decent emission limit on it. We talk about action in the and food sector, of course, because of ammonia and methane. And probably the most important is usage of personal vehicles. The public transport is a weak spot in the European Union policies. A few days ago, our European umbrella organization, uh, BEUC, European Consumers Organization, BEUC, <clears throat> issued a, a, a letter, an open letter, to the commissioner asking for decisive measures to encourage multimodal uh, transport uh, policies and uh, to make sure that consumers are protected. So would you take a, a train if you are not sure that your missed connection will be somehow secured? Or will you simply do that 300 kilometers trip by, by car? Huh? When you are, as a father, you think of having some luggages, some, some luggage with you, having two, three kids running, just being late, for example, for, for, for your next uh, train, you, you just picture it all in your head and you say, okay, let's take, let's leave the train for, for the next decade. <clears throat> let's stick to our petrol car. <clears throat> well, we call for uh, vehicle emissions uh, uh, limits. We call for phasing out of internal combustion uh, engines, the whole debate which suddenly resurfaced about the e-fuels. I think that was a, really, to, to many activists working in the field, it was a real, a, a real shame yeah, to, to, to see all that happening with the largest European economy uh, being, uh, being pushing for, for, for the measures related to the prolongation of ICE. We call for improved testing, approval and certification of vehicles. We call for emissions monitoring on road. And last but not least, the low emission and zero emission zones have to be harmonized somehow. Again, if I want to come to with, with my car to Brussels, I know that there is something in the city center which I have to adhere to. So I have to find something on a specific web page. Probably I'm good at it. And then I suddenly realize that similar emission zone is in Antwerp as well. Okay, if they are aligned. But what happens with, okay, that's just imaginary example. What happens with Utrecht? Huh? Now I'm thinking probably I have to check in advance if there is an, uh, an emission zone which I have to take care of if I pass through the city center of Bruges, or probably if I go to Dunkirk or anywhere else. Yeah? So it becomes a headache for the consumer. Instead of that, we need a European portal to provide a clear, understandable information. That's it from me now. I hope that I'm still on time. Thank you for this invitation. So, we're going to go now for, to a video message supplied by one of the MEPs. So his name's Kieran Cuff. He is an Irish Green. Hello, I'm Kieran Cuff, Green MEP for Dublin. Apologies, I could not attend the event on Europe's clean transport future. But I want to say that Europe has made progress on legislation that should reduce emissions over the coming decades. But it looks like there is a concerted effort to kill off crucial legislation for protecting human health and tackling the largest environmental health risk in Europe, air pollution. In 2020, there were 238,000 premature deaths due to air pollution. And this is a public health emergency. 
that justifies immediate ambitious action in legislative proposal on ambient air quality, on Euro 7 standards, on CO2 standards for trucks. But instead, some political groups are much more concerned about the economy. The car industry, meanwhile, despite scandals such as Dieselgate, continues to complain about the economic costs of cleaning up their act. But these companies' turnovers, are they more important than the 238,000 premature deaths that we see in Europe every year? We cannot mandate reductions in emissions and then ignore this side of the Green Deal. They go hand in hand. Like many things, regions and cities are not waiting around, and they're taking action to clean up transport, be it through promoting alternatives to car use, such as public transport, walking and cycling, or through low emission zones. So we must continue to push for action from the bottom up and the top down. And I will certainly do my part to ensure the European Union adopts ambitious proposals that will reduce the health risks of our existing transport systems. Apologies again that I can't be with you uh, today, but I wish you all the very best with your work today. Thank you to Minister Cuff. Shame you couldn't be here, but it would have been fun. Um, but I just want to emphasise from what he said there, yeah, we think these, from a public health point of view, these policies do all work together. The Ambient Air Quality Directive providing the kind of overall structure of where we should go and then in terms of transport specific policies, Euro 7 and CO2 emission standards. So next we have Anna Krajinska from Transport and Environment. Now Anna, you have a slideshow that we'll project up here as well, but welcome to the stage, Anna. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Transport and Environment is a federation of almost 60 NGOs around Europe um, who are all working on decarbonising and making um, air pollution uh, and reducing air pollution from transport. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the feasibility of clean transport policies in Europe, specifically focusing on the truck CO2 standards and Euro 7, because these are currently the biggest files um, on uh, transport um, air pollution coming through in, in Europe. Um, so starting with the truck CO2 standards, um, Transport and Environment has done a lot of work looking at the feasibility of the transition to zero emission trucks um, in Europe and how quickly that can be done. So just recently we undertook a rating of the transition plans and the goals um, of truck makers in globally, looking at how ready they are for the zero emission transition. And what we found is that really when it comes to the transition to zero emission trucking, European truck makers are really in the lead here, especially when it comes to the commitments voluntary commitments, it must be said, to transitioning to zero emission tracking. So Mercedes, Scania and MAN both have 100% zero emission tracking targets in 2040 or earlier. And in the short to medium term, Volvo is actually the most ambitious, setting a 70% reduction target already in 2030. And they are also um, selling zero emission trucks now, they're already on the market, and they are selling those in thousands of units every year already. But it has to be noted that these at the moment are voluntary commitments. To make sure that truck makers stick to them, we need the truck CO2 standards to keep truck makers on course. Now, of course, when it comes to the adoption of zero emission technology, um, sorry about that, um, price is really important. And when it comes to trucking, it's actually the total co cost of ownership that is the most important because it's the fuel costs that are the majority of the total cost of running a vehicle over its lifetime. And when we look at the um, total cost of ownership of zero emission trucks, um, we already see that in 2025, battery electric vehicles are cheaper to run in 70% of use cases in the EU. By 2030, this will be over 90%. And what we see is that for um, urban and regional transport, this percentage share is much, much higher. It's much easier to decarbonize those kind of trucking trips. And it's only the really 
long haul, long distance trucking that will de uh, decarbonize and transition to zero emission trucks at a later pace. But when it comes to cities and urban areas, we can go very quickly. And it's financially advantageous for trucking operators to transition to zero emission technology as fast as possible. So there's really no reason for truck makers not to provide those products to consumers. Now, there's a big debate here in Brussels whether there's um, e-fuels and also other fuels such as biofuels and biogas should be included within the upcoming CO2 standards for trucks. Um, now, what we've done is a cost analysis on using battery electric vehicles versus e-fuels with ICE engine trucks. And what we see is that e-fuels are much more expensive in trucks than having a battery electric vehicle. This is even the case when it comes to second-hand e-diesel trucks. What we see is that in 2035, BEV trucks will be 31% cheaper to own and run than an e-diesel truck. And from an operator's perspective, it does not make sense to move towards this technology. From an air pollution perspective, it also makes no sense because when we look at the test data from cars, there is no appreciable difference between air pollution from fossil fuels or e-fuels. Yes, there are some differences on, in air pollutants or for certain vehicles, but it really depends on the vehicle. Some have higher NOx, um, but lower PN. Some have um, higher other pollutants. So for sure, e-fuels will not help um, when it comes to reducing pollution in Europe. And this is why the transition to battery electric vehicles for air pollution is much more important. And we cannot be diverted by solutions such as e-fuels, which are very inefficient, very inexpensive, and do not deliver the air quality improvements that we really need in Europe. Um, that's really everything for me on trucks at the moment when it comes to economic feasibility. Um, now I'd like to really talk about Euro 7. Now, before I start going into the details, I'd really like to say that Euro 7 and the CO2 standards, whether it come, goes for cars or for trucks, really go hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive. We see that, and this is something that other presenters will touch upon in forthcoming presentations, what we really see is that Euro 7 delivers emissions reductions that are substantial on top of the CO2 standards that have been agreed for cars and also the proposed CO2 standards for trucks. Now, when it comes to Euro 7, um, the key points to note is that we already have the technology available to substantially reduce um, pollution from internal combustion engines. And this is really important to do so because we expect that despite the planned phase out of cars in Europe um, and the increased rate of um, the transition to zero emission tra trucking, there'll be about 100 million cars sold in Europe before the phase out that have an internal combustion engine. When it comes to large trucks, it'll be around 3.1 million. So a substantial number and those trucks will stay on our roads for decades, causing air pollution. Now, the technology is available already. There have been substantial um, improvements made um, since the Dieselgate scandal, and the technology is cheap and affordable. We hear a lot from car makers that Euro 7 will cost thousands of euros. This is simply not the case. When we look at the Commission's impact assessment, Euro 7 is expected to cost an additional 90 to 150 euros, and that's all in. That's not just the cost of the technology, that's also type approval. If we had great ambition, which was aligned with the findings of the Commission's impact assessment, this is somewhere in the region of 300 euros. This is less than a paint upgrade on the Renault Clio. Um, but unlike a paint job, it delivers substantial environmental benefits in terms of air pollution. For trucks, the cost is just 2,600 euros per medium truck and 2,800 euros for a large truck. And that's just 2.6% of a medium truck's price and 1.9% of a large truck's price. And when we look at the total cost of ownership, because fueling costs are so much bigger, that share dramatically falls. So when it comes to the cost for economic operators, it really is marginal and affordable. 
Now, we often hear that um, Euro 7 will also make cars unaffordable for people and that consumers um, will not want to buy more expensive vehicles. Well, in 2021, we did a consumer survey of, um, on Euro 7, focusing specifically on new car buyers. And what we found is that overwhelmingly, European consumers in the main automotive markets in the EU support paying up to 500 euros more if car makers made their cars significantly less polluting. So there is the willingness from consumers to spend more on products that are less polluting. They just need to be brought by car makers onto the market. And Euro 7 is the regulation to force car makers to do so. Otherwise, car makers will not put this technology on the road voluntarily. Now, we often hear that car makers have had quite a hard time during the COVID crisis because of supply chain issues, um, because of rising inflation. And yes, while there has been a decrease in the amount of car sales, what we've really seen is that at the same time, car makers have used that position to drive up prices of vehicles and shift sales towards more premium and expensive models. This has resulted in Europe's five biggest car makers, so that's BMW, Renault, Mercedes, Stellantis, and VW, more than doubling their profits since 2019, from 28 billion to 64 billion in 2022, which is a staggering amount of money. And while car makers are investing that money into the EV transition, a lot of it is also going out to shareholders. So of those car makers, the latest announcements are that from that money, 27 billion will be spent on shareholder dividends and stock buybacks, which ultimately also benefit shareholders. Comparatively, for example, for Stellantis and VW, the entire cost of the Euro 7 regulation over, the, over its entire lifetime would cost them around 30%, 30 for Stellantis, 37 for VW of just their 2022 profits. So Euro 7 is absolutely possible, absolutely financially viable, and we need to make sure that whatever, um, that when the proposal is agreed on by the council, by the parliament, that we have a robust and effective emission standard and not just a standard on paper. That's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Anna. Very insightful. Um, I always like a, a bit of a graph that shows, you know, pokes a hole in the industry argument. So thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate you laying that all out. And um, yeah, I really like the points you said there about the trucks and the feasibility as well. So yeah, very much appreciated. Um, going hand in hand in that, we're going to hear from Dr. Ben Marner, air quality consultant. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about those kind of technical aspects, I guess. Over to you, Ben. Um, we quantified the effects of um, low and zero emission zones, or LEZs and ZEZs, on annual mean NO2 and PM2.5 concentrations in five European cities. And then separately, we also quantified the effects of Euro 7 on the same, um, same pollutants in the same cities. So I'll briefly run through our approach, then quickly summarize our conclusions with respect to uh, the LEZs and ZEZs, and then finally um, run through our conclusions on Euro 7. When member states report compliance with the Ambient Air Quality Directive, attention usually starts to focus on a few worst case monitoring sites. That's because air quality is usually reported through monitoring, and because until all sites um, meet the limit value, the member state isn't in compliance. This shows an example of annual mean NO2 concentrations measured in Greater Paris over the last decade. And you can see that this site in, I can't point, the site in red, um, the A1 auto station, has consistently recorded the highest concentrations. Um, lots of sites have exceeded uh, the 40 microgram per meter cube limit value, but as air quality improves hopefully in the future, it will be this site or another one like it which ultimately determines when this area will come into compliance. 
So with this in mind, we've looked at predicting air quality in the future at these worst case monitors in each city. So in the case of Greater Paris, we've predicted the effects of measures at this site. But having said that, we're not linked to the site specifics, so our conclusions do hold anywhere else in each city that experiences equivalent concentrations. So we took measurements from paired roadside and background sites and the difference between them to determine the local road increment to concentrations, the, the contribution from those local roads to the total. We then used emissions models to predict how those local road contributions will change over time and as a result of our measures. For the LEZ and ZEZ work, we compiled simplified emissions inventories for each city using fleet projections provided by t and &E, the Clean Cities Campaign, and the ICCT, and using the COPERT emissions model. And for the Euro 7 work, we relied heavily on the Commission's own impact assessment, so our conclusions for Euro 7 are broadly aligned with the Commission's own work. This shows how we expect air quality in 2027 to improve as a result of LEZs that require cars to at least meet the Euro 6 D temp type approval standard. The top graphs for NO2, the bottom ones for PM 2.5. The yellow bars show the effect of local roads on concentrations without the LEZs. The blue shows the effects of the same roads with the LEZs, and the green shows the contribution from all other sources. So, for example, if you look at the first two bars in the top graph, you see that annual mean NO2 in Madrid is predicted to reduce from 34 micrograms per meter cubed without the LEZ to 26 micrograms with the LEZ. And the 45% figure there is the relative change in that local road contribution. So, in terms of NO2, this type of LEZ isn't going to single-handedly bring us below the 10 microgram per meter cube WHO guideline value, but it will still give significant benefits in all the cities we looked at. The reductions for PM2.5 are smaller, and road traffic also makes up a smaller proportion of the total PM2.5 concentrations, but the benefits to PM2.5 from Euro 6 based LEZs are still certainly worth having. This now shows the effects of ZEZs in our cities in 2030. And the, these are zones in which only zero exhaust emissions cars, vans, buses, and trucks are allowed to enter with an assumed 95% compliance rate. We now see an almost complete removal of the local road contribution to NO2. For PM2.5, the reductions are again smaller, but still appreciable, um, right, yeah, up to ranging 44 to 48% of the local road component. And the reason the reductions for PM2.5 are so much smaller is that in our ZEZs, we still expect significant emissions from non-exhaust sources. So that's mainly wear on brakes, tires, and the road surface. When we move to an electric vehicle, we get rid of the exhaust emissions completely and modify the braking, but are still left with most of these non-exhaust emissions. These aren't exact numbers, they're, they're not linked to precisely tailored local interventions, but they do give an idea of the, the kind of improvements that we're likely to see from these types of measures. But I should be clear that a big limitation of our work is that we've only looked at the local, the local traffic emissions. By 2030, we might sensibly expect these green lines to also have reduced a lot, um, but we've not been able to show that as part of our study. So I think there are two key messages from, the, this, from this part of the work. The first is that these pollutants, and particularly PM2.5, are problems with lots of components. There isn't a single measure that's going to single-handedly solve urban air quality. And we're only going to get really low future concentrations by targeting lots of sources of which road traffic is clearly one. And the second message is that these zones can be really effective at improving air quality in hotspot locations. On their own, they can accelerate compliance with current and future limit values. And that makes them a really important tool to consider both locally 
and when setting EU policy. So if, for example, the Commission had included LEZs in its impact assessment of the Air Quality Directive revision, it seems almost inevitable it would have shown greater achievability of more stringent future limits. I'm now going to move on to the Euro 7 part of the work. And a key point to make is that over these timescales, um, which now extend out to 2050, traffic emissions and their effects on concentrations are expected to reduce significantly, even without Euro 7. This shows the local traffic contribution to annual mean NO2 and PM2.5 in Madrid out to 2050. Um, and these reductions are driven by existing Euro standards up to Euro 6. And also importantly for NO2, the expected electrification of the fleet. And it's that that really drives these big reductions in NO2 out to 2050. I've now added the trajectory we expect with Euro 7. And I should explain that the line here for NO2 is actually for policy option 3A that the Commission considered in its impact assessment, while the line for PM2.5 is for the proposal itself. They are different because the proposal is less ambitious than policy option 3A in terms of NO2, but it's actually more ambitious in terms of PM2.5. So despite the expected electrification of the fleet over this time scale, we st still see significant additional Im improvements. So the local, con local road contribution to NO2 in Madrid in 2035 will roughly halve if we adopted policy option 3A as Euro 7, and um, the road contribution to annual mean PM2.5 in 2050 would reduce by about a third. And these reductions are mirrored in all the other cities we looked at. So um, in Madrid, Greater Paris and Brussels, the local road contribution to NO2 will fall by around about 90% in 2050 if we adopt Euro 7 compared with not adopting Euro 7. The reductions in Milan and Warsaw are slightly smaller, but still more than a 70% reduction um, in 2050 caused by adopting Euro 7. Now, these are just the local road contributions to concentrations. Concentration, total concentrations, including all other sources, will be higher than this. Um, but we're not able to accurately predict these, these other sources out over this time frame for this Euro 7 work, which goes, goes up to 2050. So that's why I'm focusing here on, on the local road contributions. An important part of Euro 7 is that it in, includes limits on, t on brake wear. Um, the line graph on the left shows how we expect brake emissions to reduce up to 2050 from, your, from the Euro 7 proposal when compared with a situation without Euro 7. And the bar chart on the right focuses on, focuses on 2035 and shows the local traffic-related PM2.5, both with and without Euro 7. One thing we looked at was what happens if we were to bring forward um, the proposed three milligram limit on brake wear emissions. And that's shown by the blue line and the dark blue columns here. So looking at the, the bar chart on the right, if we were to adopt the Commission's proposed Euro 7, um, the local traffic-related PM2.5 contribution in 2035 would fall by about 10%. But if we were to bring forward by 10 years the proposed 3 milligram per kilometer PM10 brake wear emissions limit, this reduction would almost double. So here in Brussels, that would reduce annual mean PM2.5 by about half a microgram, which, again, isn't going to solve all our urban air quality issues on its own, but PM2.5 is a composite problem, and we really need to look at all its sources. Euro 7 also sets limits on tyre wear emissions. Um, we don't have the specification of these yet, so we looked at a range of potential options. This, again, focuses here in Brussels. The top line shows how we expect the local traffic-related PM2.5 to reduce over time if we adopt Euro 7 as it is without any limits on tyre wear emissions. Um, the dashed lines then show the effect of increasingly more stringent 
reductions in tire wear emissions. Um, so, for example, if we were to reduce tire wear emissions from Euro 7 compliant vehicles by 40%, we would reduce total, total traffic related PM 2.5 by an additional 20% on top of the reductions we've already seen. So, to sum up, um, we've shown that LEZs and ZEZs can be extremely effective at reducing air quality in hotspot locations. It's measurements in these hotspots that ultimately determine a member state's compliance with the ambient air quality directive. So, these zones, particularly combined with other measures, are really valuable tools to, to accelerate compliance with existing limit values and can make more stringent future limits much more achievable. And in terms of Euro 7, um, we've shown that despite the expected electrification of the fleet over time, we still expect Euro 7 to deliver significant additional benefits, even out as far as 2050. There are some details to Euro 7 which might be ironed out, but um, yeah, and, it, and it's not going to solve air all, the, all our air quality issues on its own, but I don't think that makes Euro 7 any less valuable. And that's it. Um, if you wanted to know more, there are links to the two studies there, and um, thanks for your time. Thank you very much for that, um, Ben. I, I really like those graphs. They were, they were beautiful. I think it's good to remember that you know, you see these two lines that are fairly close together or something like that on, on you know, displaying the difference in PM or NO2 pollution. But I think it's good to, you know, know in between those lines that the, the differential impact there is billions of euro and thousands of lives. So I think that's really good to illustrate. And also I, I, I like that you, you illustrate the fact that, you know, low emission zones aren't going to solve all of our problems. It does need to be kind of a system-wide approach that... Um, that sees that you know we reach these targets and we protect health. Um, I think it's yeah it's good you've talked about the uh, hotspots because we're going to go to Toma Toma Lim from um, Euro Cities now who's going to talk a bit more about you know the role that kind of cities and regions play in this and, and kind of what's at stake here I guess. So Toma, please. Thank you very much, Kale. So I'm Tom Alim. I work as a policy advisor for mobility and air quality at EuroCities. So for those who don't know our organizations, we are a network of more than 200 cities uh, in Europe. So we have members uh, in the EU, but also outside of the EU. Um, and obviously, uh, well, the topic of transport emissions is at the core of our work on making cities more attractive. Um, let me start by quoting one, the results of uh, a survey actually we, we conducted recently. Um, we uh, polled, let's say, uh, around yeah, 200 mayors in the EU and we asked them what are your top priorities. And guess what was the first priority? Climate. The second one, mobility. Uh, and, and we asked them, so what concretely, what, what do you have in mind when addressing those top priorities and the topic of low emission zones uh, came up uh, a lot? Um, making, well, rebalancing public space and, and limiting uh, the impact of uh, transport was, uh, was among the measures that were quoted by, by the members. So we really see in cities a big willingness to address uh, transport emissions. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, cities that have been active in this field for, for decades. I mean, we often mention the example of London, uh, which uh, implemented a uh, low emission zone and then an ultra low emission zones um, over the past few years with significant results. I mean, uh, when, for instance, when they set up their low, uh, ultra low emission zones, they managed to reduce nitrogen dioxide by 20% in a few months in 2019. So we see that there is really, um, uh, well, that cities are ready to, to, to take actions and, and take uh, bold measures to, to address uh, transport emissions. But obviously, um, they need support. And uh, we, we've seen uh, in Anna's presentation that uh, the EU framework is actually instrumental to help them uh, tackle transport emissions, be they uh, carbon dioxide emissions or air, air pollutant emissions. Um, so over the 
well, we've seen that the Green Deal, especially, offered a lot of opportunities to to help cities address transport emissions. So we had the uh, Fit for 55 package, which really uh, tackled um, emissions from cars and vans. We got the Zero Pollution Action Plan, also, which actually the ambient air quality uh, directive is one of the the, the results. Um, and we've seen also a uh, new transport strategy that uh, were brought forward by the European Commission uh, to help also have an influence on, on urban mobility policies in cities. Um, I'm not going to repeat the figures that uh, Kale mentioned. Uh, air pollution is, well, definitely a big issue in cities. Uh, you mentioned, Kale, the fact that 97% of uh, urban areas uh, in the EU are exposed to uh, levels of PM2.5 higher than those recommended by the WHO. Um, and we know that um, for certain pollutants, road traffic is actually the main, the main culprit. culprit. Um, if you think about NOx, for instance, uh, I think it's in the US around 37% uh, of NOx that are emitted by the, uh, by the road transport, uh, by road transport in cities. But of course, that's an average. If you think, if you take the example of Paris, for instance, NOx represent 50, around 57% of the total uh, of NOx emitted in the city. Well, there's a big competition with, uh, with the heating sector, obviously. Uh, and we see even in certain cities, which are also addressing air pollution in a holistic manner, like Warsaw, we see that transport is actually catching up with the heating sector, which is actually the main source of pollution. So we really need to have this, well, to have a bold action, an ambition action at the EU level to help cities uh, address, address transport emissions. Um, when it comes to, in general, when it comes to urban uh, mobility policies, the main mantra of many urban planners is avoid, shift, improve. I would add also and electrify and clean the rest. Uh, so making, reducing transport emissions is not only about having cleaner or zero emission vehicles, it's also about adopting other measures to offer uh, credible alternatives to to the, to the citizens, to, to the, for the transport of goods, for instance. So this is also something that, well, most, most of our members are, are addressing. Um, so we see that um, there is one, well, there is especially one dossier at the moment that is being discussed that Anna mentioned and that, that Ben also mentioned, Euro 7. Um, it's... Actually, yeah, as you mentioned, very challenged, being challenged at the moment by the automotive industry. You mentioned the, the fact that they, they talk a lot about the costs of this measure. We don't hear a lot about the costs on uh, public health systems, for instance. This is not something that is often brought in the debate, but this is uh, if you, we really want to look at the whole, all the perspective of the issue, this is something that we also should, should address. Um, and the fact is that what's happening at the moment on Euro 7 is definitely wrong because from a city's perspective, uh, we need to actually have a, a Euro 7 regulation that makes a difference for, for transport emissions in cities. We mentioned a lot low emission zones or zero emission zones. Uh, they are most of the time based on, well, the criteria for entering low emission zones are mostly based on Euro standards. So if tomorrow you have a weak Euro 7, how are you going to explain that this person driving a Euro 6 and this person driving a Euro 7 would be, would be treated differently? So that's actually the main, the main challenge for, for our members. And we, they really need to have to, well, to get this tool to help them to, to reduce, um, well, fine particles or NOx emissions in the future because at the moment, in parallel to the discussion on Euro 7, there, are also, uh, there is also another directive that is, that is being uh, discussed at the EU level, so the Ambient Air Quality Directive, which sets also higher air quality standards for, uh, in Europe. So in the end, those standards will have to be implemented by cities, uh, and there is not so much they can do if they don't have, let's say, the, all the enablers, including source specific regulations that will help them to attain those, those targets. And well, we'll see. It's still, to, it's still in discussion, but so we'll see what are what's the final level of ambition of this of this directive. But if if uh, the Parliament's position is confirmed, we'll see about this. This it would it means that we'll have to go a step uh, a step further in in tackling air pollution in cities. So it's really important that this regulation is as as ambitious as as possible. 
Um, so in parallel, of course, we believe that this is this is also important to 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 slash CO2 emissions from transport because you may know, but there are now more than 100 cities that are embarked on a mission to reach climate neutrality in 2030. 2030 is like tomorrow, basically, um, and we they see this this obviously transport is is a big part of, uh, of uh, carbon emissions emitted in cities. So we also need to have both in parallel regulations tackling air pollutant emissions and CO2, CO2 emissions in cities to, to help them also become climate neutral. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, basically um, the, the, the main interest of cities. So we were really happy to see that the EU finally phased out uh, uh, petrol and diesel uh, vehicles, with the exception of e-fuels, uh, well, vehicles running on e-fuels. We'll see uh, if uh, what's the, what are the going to be the developments in the future. Um, but we, yeah, we believe that this is this was essential. Um, there are also discussions at the moment on heavy-duty vehicles that Anna presented on trucks, but on buses as well. This is often uh, something that uh, that's not really clear for many. But we from if the Commission's proposal is approved, it means that after 2030, we'll have only uh, zero emission buses sold in the EU. And this is also very important for cities because one part of their action is also to lead by example. So if they manage to decarbonize their public, uh, pu public transport fleet as soon as possible, this will also, well, allow them to bring everyone on board, uh, their citizens, but also uh, companies using zero emission trucks, for instance. Also, this is some, something that we support, and we hope that uh, the level of ambition also of this new piece of legislation will be, will be confirmed in the, in the months to come. Um, so that's um, why we... Um, yeah, what we've been uh, working on at your cities uh, at the moment, um, we, as I said in my introduction, it's also, well, transport policies, well, reducing transport emissions is also about providing alternatives in cities to, for, for the transport of passengers or goods. So we know that um, the next battle in the coming years, we also, once we manage to electrify or to reduce trans uh, air pollutant emissions from transport, is also going to be about, uh, about fostering model shift. And this is, I must say, a harder battle, probably, uh, because you have to convince everyone in your city to, to change their habits. It's about making public transport more attractive, uh, allowing the commuters to, to rely on efficient, uh, efficient and high-quality services uh, when, they do, when they commute to work. It's about uh, providing, uh, building more infrastructure also for um, for pedestrians, for cyclists. So at the moment, actually, we're also working on a new milestone that uh, we expect by the end of the year, which is this EU, big EU strategy on cycling. And we really hope that it's going to make a difference for, for cities because they have been, especially since the COVID uh, crisis, they've been really pushing a lot to develop cycling practices in cities. So, um, but sometimes there are uh, roadblocks uh, on, their, on their journey toward, toward uh, making cities more cyc uh, cycle friendly, like lack of standards for certain things, lack of data uh, to allow them to, to, well, to give uh, more, uh, more, more, more place for, for active modes of transport. So that's a bit what I wanted to share. Uh, thank you very much.